Greetings, everybody. Um, so today we're going to be doing a lecture on the next chapter in our textbook, Chapter 12 on Judaism. But before we get started, I do want to thank you for the feedback that you've been providing me on the Google Classroom with the check-in assignment. I'll be looking into those and trying to determine whether a synchronous meeting would be beneficial for our course purposes. Um, at this point, still to be determined, I know in some of my classes we're doing some uh, Zoom meetups, um, but we'll find out if, um, if there's just too much confusion or just too much uncertainty um, moving forward in this distance learning situation um, to see if we do need to meet up as a class. Uh, to this point, I don't think so, but um, I'll definitely be looking at your guys' comments. Uh, so if you haven't commented on that assignment yet, please do go back to last week's, um, last week's yeah, check-in assignment from Friday, okay? And make sure you let me know your feedback on that. All right, so this week we're doing Judaism. Um, I'm going to go through the lecture. I'm going to share a video with you guys. Um, and then we're going to look at the Google Calendar for this week, uh, considering this is a new week. Um, as I'm recording this for March 30th, um, Monday morning. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right in then, shall we? Uh, so chapter 12 is Judaism. Uh, the world religions that we're going to be jumping into now are going to be much more familiar to us. Um, some of the big three, right? So we have Judaism, uh, we'll have Christianity next, and then we'll have Islam, right? Uh, so those ones are kind of the heavy hitters, uh, number-wise, up there with uh, Hinduism, okay? So let's go on and forward. All right, so for the Jews, uh, Yahweh is the name of God identified in Hebrew uh, by the four consonants, right? So uh, Y, um, H, W, H, okay? And those are pictured, depicted right above me um, in those consonants commonly uh, translated in English as Yahweh, okay? Uh, rather than pronouncing the name observant, uh, Jews have traditionally stated Adonai, which means Lord. So when you hear the Hebrew word um, in Jewish prayers, Adonai, or Yahweh, they're talking about God. They actually don't use the word God, G-O-D, okay? It's kind of out of respect for uh, his holy name. They also say Elohim, uh, um, al um, and uh, Eli. All right. So, uh, obviously, we're familiar with this character. Uh, Moses is the most important prophet in the Jewish tradition. Um, yes, Moses is technically a prophet, even though he was also a patriarch in the faith. Um, here you see him uh, in a sculpture um, that shows him holding the Torah, uh, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. If, um, if you wanted to uh, take a look at that, um, so that would be what encompasses the Torah. All right. According to the Bible, the Torah was pronounced to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. Okay, so um, directly given to Moses. Uh, that's where we get the Ten Commandments and also the many different uh, laws and traditions that come out of the Jewish tradition. Um, and also, this, this starts kind of a theme with how God chooses, or Yahweh chooses to communicate with the Jewish people through the prophets. Um, so, one of the pieces of sacred script in the uh, Jewish tradition is the page of the Talmud. Uh, Talmud uh, contains teachings of the rabbis to the first six centuries of the Common Era. Passages from the Mishnah uh, are in the center, and these passages are surrounded by the later commentary known as Gemara. Um, so these texts would have been more prevalent in uh, Palestine and Babylon uh, between 450 and 600 A.D. So this is following... Um, this is following the times of Christ, okay? So this is how the Torah would have been um, distributed or understood or read was through the Talmud. Uh, another discovery that is quite significant in the sacred scripture, sacred texts of the uh, Judaic tradition is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. And uh, this archaeological discovery um, was seen as 
the discovery of some of the first translations of the Old Testament or Torah. Uh, scrolls were discovered in uh, in the caves near the Dead Sea itself, so that's why it's called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and they believe that this discovery of these of these scrolls could have been dated back to um, some uh, some of the early BC centuries. <laughs> Uh, Ark of Titus in Rome it commemorates the general's victory over the Jews in AD 70. Um, so this is when, uh, following the, destru the destruction of the Jewish, uh, the Jerusalem Jewish temple uh, by the Roman Empire in lieu of many rebellions that were going on, uh, especially during the time of Christ. Uh, you could see uh, allusions in the, Old, in the New Testament to some of these uprisings that occurred. Uh, that were from the Jewish people. Um, and the Ark of Titus commemorates General Titus's victory over the, this uprising um, and the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the Holocaust, or the Shoha, uh, is, uh, is something that's quite possibly the most um, infamous, well, definitely the most infamous, but probably the most alluded to uh, anti-Seministic uh, practice of human history. Uh, you can see depicted here the entrance to Auschwitz. Uh, labor makes you free is what is uh, depicted up there. So Reich machen frei uh, in, in the German text there. Six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust or Shoha uh, and the Holocaust significantly impacted Judaism as a religion forcing theological challenges. Uh, and that's that. That's obvious enough. Uh, you can think of Judaism as uh, um, a people, uh, a lifestyle more so than a religion. So when that lifestyle is obviously challenged with the burden of a large percentage of your following uh, being put to death, um, you can understand that not just theological challenges, but lifestyle challenges as well. Um, so here's a little talk about prayer. Um, this is what makes Judaism kind of unique. Even though it is a people, it is a nation, it is a, a way of life, it's, it's, um, it also encompasses a certain religion, obviously. So observant Jews pray three times daily with an additional prayer service on the Sabbath. Uh, so morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, the morning prayer, they wear the talit, or uh, the prayer shawl, and tafelin or uh, prayer amulets, right? So you can see that depicted right above me again here uh, with uh, uh, Talit over his shoulders and uh, Talfin in his, um, on his uh, forearm there. The prayers come from the Bible or from the writings of the rabbis. Um, so I would equate the common prayer, which is called uh, Shema Yisrael, um, so the, the, the daily prayer of the Jewish people is Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Ayirat, um, which is here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Um, I would equate it to probably uh, what would have come out of this for, especially Christianity, um, since we are trying to compare uh, our, our world religions to Christianity. I would compare, compare it to the, the Jesus prayer, right? Uh, Domine Jesu Cristo, Fili Domine Misedere uh, Mie uh, Peccatoris, uh, which is uh, from the Latin, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, those 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 short little prayers that just take a moment for us to actually uh, enter into kind of a spiritual relationship with God uh, was comes out of this Jewish tradition for us as uh, as Christians. Uh, I want to take a moment with this really quickly because the Shema Israel is 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 crucial is a crucial staple foundation for uh, the spiritual exercises of the Jewish people. So I'm going to show a video really quickly here um, that will tell us a little bit more about Shema Israel, which is listen or hear, O Israel, and the significance of that. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Now the first word of the Shema is hear, or listen, which in Hebrew is pronounced Shema. That's where the prayer gets its name. 
Now, Shema is a really common word in the Hebrew Bible, and it's obvious why. Hearing is a very universal activity. It's usually connected with the ear, as in Proverbs chapter 20. Ears that Shema and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. Now, that seems basic enough, but if you look at the other ways that Hebrew authors can use the word Shema, they use it to mean more than just let sound waves enter your ear. In Hebrew, Shema can also mean pay attention to or focus on. So when Leah, who wasn't loved by her husband Jacob, she has a son, and she names him Simon, or in Hebrew, Shimon, because, she says, the Lord has Shema that I am unloved. So Shema means to hear and to pay attention to, and even more. It can also mean responding to what you hear. This is why so many of the cries for help in the book of Psalms begin with a call that God listen. Psalm 27, verse 7. Shema my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful. Answer me. So asking God to Shema is at the same time asking God to act, to do something. It's similar to when God asks people to listen. Like when the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai, God says, If you Shema me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Now, there's a couple interesting things about this verse in Exodus. In Hebrew, the word Shema is repeated twice in this sentence to give it emphasis. If you Shema Shema, meaning listen closely. But also notice that from God's point of view, listening is basically the same as keeping the covenant. So when God asks the people to Shema, what he means is that they listen and obey. And that's the last fascinating thing about Shema. In ancient Hebrew, there is no separate word for obey meaning to carry out the wishes of someone who knows better than you or is in authority over you. So in the Bible, if you want to say, I will listen and do what you say, you use the single word, Shema. In Hebrew, listening and doing are two sides of the same coin. This is why later in Israel's history, when the people were breaking their covenant promises to God, the Hebrew prophets would say things like, they have ears, but they're not listening. The Israelites, of course, could hear just fine, but they weren't actually listening, or else they would act differently. And so, in the end, listening in the Bible is about giving respect to the one speaking to you and doing what they say. Real listening takes effort and action, and that's the Hebrew word Shema. All right. So, um, just to kind of reiterate there, the uh, the words themselves, even though it's a very short prayer, right? It's a very short prayer. Uh, remember, uh, Shema Israel Adonai Elohim Adonai uh, um, means a lot. It means a lot. It means more than just the words themselves. All right, let's go ahead and move on in the lecture here. So Shofar is a ram's horn used to mark the beginning of the seasonal religion observances. Uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, uh, the Jewish New Year, would be one. Um, where it's blown 100 times, uh, mostly to commemorate military um, significant battles that were won by the people of Israel, um, but it can vary. Uh, like I said, for the most part, it, it does signify religious seasons. Uh, and on that note, some of the most popular religious seasons would be the Passover, the cedar plate, or meal. Uh, Eight-day festival of Passover commemorates the exodus from Egypt and occurs in the spring. Um, much like our um, our Christian cedar meal or the Last Supper would be during the time of Passover, so it comes out of that, right? Uh, exodus out of Egypt, kind of like our exodus from sin and death, right? Uh, the cedar meal is the central event of Passover. Um, Hanukkah. So we know Hanukkah pretty well. We've heard it before. Uh, is the uh, featuring during uh, during that time is the menorah is the most uh, uh, recognizable symbol of Judaism. So the menorah is the candles, right? Uh, it holds eight candles plus one. Hanukkah commemorates a Jewish victory in 164 BC. So if you uh, uh, later on we'll hear from the Maccabees. Uh, this would be commemorating the victory of the Maccabees. Um, during the time of uh, Hanukkah. Um, and then uh, lastly here, uh, the Ark of the Covenant uh, with the Torah in it. Uh, so obviously the Ark would be symbolized as um, the thing that holds the law, that holds the teachings of God within it, right? Uh, State of Israel is also uh, itself a nation, right? Um, and it is symbolized with the Star of David 
one of the most popular kings.